So our next speaker is Lieutenant James Bruce. The lieutenant was assigned to Scripps on an academic assignment as part of the Living Marine Resources Maritime Law Enforcement Office of the U.S. Coast Guard. He'll be heading to Charleston, South Carolina to be the commanding officer of the Southeast Regional Fisheries Training Center after the program. Oh, there's so much that I want to say <laughs> about James. <laughs> But I also realize you might want to use this for a professional purpose moving forward. And so I'll just, I'll just say that um, I'm aware that James knows every word to Paradise by the Dashboard Light uh, by Meatloaf. I know because I also know that. And we had our own sing-off in Catalina on that song. But I just have to say this one other thing. And there's no good transition. But do you remember at Catalina when you and Sean Gim and Daria made the video, the Sarah McLaughlin video? with the kelp as a scarf and the music and, oh man, I know that's an inside joke for the rest of you here, but it was, I think about it sometimes and I almost, I, I get a little teary with laughter because it was a good one. <laughs> All right, the title of James's presentation today is Illegal Fishing, Seafood Slavery, Satellites and International Treaties, Tracking Refrigerated Cargo Vessels to Inform the FAO's Agreement on Port State Measures. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Hey, kiddo. How you doing? There's my two-year-old back there. <clears throat> what you're looking at is how a fishing vessel can stay at sea for years. Now, there's two types of vessels here. The smaller one on the right is a fishing vessel. And the large one on the left is a refrigerated cargo transshipment vessel. Now, a fishing vessel can stay at sea for years because of an operation called transshipment. While at sea, a fishing vessel pulls alongside one of these large refrigerated cargo transshipment vessels, and they offload their catch, they can refuel, and then that fishing vessel can go back out to sea, or excuse me, stay out at sea, and continue on fishing. It's one of the least studied ways that illegally caught fish enter the market. Now, my project deals with seafood slavery, with illegal fishing, and international treaties. And what I did was use satellite technology to track these refrigerated cargo transshipment vessels across the world in order to inform a United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization treaty that's called the Agreement on Port State Measures. And I wound up tracking 784 of these big old suckers. <laughs> now this international treaty is designed to address illegal fishing, but it does so much more. We also end up attacking the key components that supports seafood slavery, industrial fishing, and one of the ways that illegally caught fish enter the global market. So let's walk through the steps here. First, I'm gonna discuss the state of global fisheries. We're gonna go over a hypothetical example of seafood slavery. I'm gonna discuss transshipment, and then we're gonna outline the agreement on port state measures, that international treaty. And lastly, I'm gonna show how satellite technology can inform the treaty. All right, step one, some context on the state of global fisheries. Now, overall, fisheries continue to decline. We've heard a lot about that today so far. Consumption of fish has risen since the 1960s. Now, the United Nations has uh, reported that two-thirds of the world's fish stocks are fished at globally, or excuse me, biologically unsustainable levels. Shown, wild-caught fish has remained static. The same amount of fish have been landed since the 1980s every single year, but research has shown that vessels are having to go further and further offshore to maintain that level of fish landed at port. Now, in addition to declining fish stocks, instances of seafood slavery have become exposed in recent years. Let's take a look at what can happen aboard some commercial fishing vessels. Now, this is a hypothetical example, but it's based on real cases. Okay, a Southeast Asian fishing company charters its vessel to fish in New Zealand waters. The Southeast Asian company, they own the boat, they fund the fishing, and they also provide the crew. But the fishing vessels are fishing in New Zealand waters, and so when you buy the fish at the market, it says, caught in New Zealand. Now, to crew the fishing vessels, in order to get people to man these boats, the Southeast Asian company uses a manning agent who recruits men from countries where people are desperate for work. So they're promised a well-paying job. They sign multiple contracts, often in languages 
other than their own. The recruiters provide a fake or forged visa to illegally get into the country that they're going to be fishing in. For the privilege to work, the people are told that they have to offer collateral to the recruiter. And if they can't offer collateral, they start this new job in another country on a vessel in debt. And once they get to sea, things get worse. On the boat, they're forced to work long hours and they're allowed very little sleep, often with no medical care. Their passports and paperwork is confiscated. And so even if they try to leave the vessel, they could be subject to arrest because they don't have any paperwork. Or if they do leave the vessel, then they still owe a debt to the manning agent and to the recruiter. Since the men start off in debt, there's no labor cost. The company makes a profit, and the catch is offloaded and processed in New Zealand. And then it's distributed into markets across the world, including the United States and the EU, where the labels say it's fished in New Zealand. The Southeast Asian company gets the money from the sales of the fish, and in this hypothetical explanation, seven countries are involved in a global market. And in some cases, fishing vessels subject to these conditions can stay at sea for years. And this is because of a maritime operation called transshipment. And through transshipment, illegal fish enter the market. In my project, like I said, I tracked 784 of these transshipment vessels over four years. Now, there's a fleet of these large cargo vessels across the world's oceans. Transshipment is very simple. It's transferring goods from one vessel to another. A fishing vessel pulls alongside and can offload their catch. They refuel, they continue fishing. Now, this is not to say that transshipment is nefarious or always illegal. In some cases, it's regulated and completely legitimate. In this context, it's troublesome because those vessels with modern slaves aboard never get to port because of transshipment. Now further, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, it threatens global fishing stocks. Illegally caught fish threaten marine ecosystems and biodiversity, and they undermine marine conservation efforts. The United Nations recently estimated that one in five fish in the global market is either caught illegally, is not reported when it's caught, or is caught under unregulated circumstances without management plans. One of the ways that illegal fish get into the market is through transshipment, where they actually launder fish. Now check this out, in frame A of the diagram, the upper vessel is the legal vessel and the illegal vessel is below. Both are fishing out at sea. In frame B, the legal vessel and the illegal vessel, they transship their catch onto that light gray refrigerated cargo vessel in the middle. Both vessels are refueled and they both are resupplied and they go back out to sea and they continue fishing. Now, the legal and illegal catch is mixed together aboard the transshipment vessel. Frame C shows that the cargo vessel and the legal vessel offload at port, and now inspectors can no longer identify where the fish came from, whether it was legal or illegal. The illegal vessel can therefore avoid returning to port for months or years at a time, and the illegal fish is laundered right into the market. The records and report from these offloads at port that the inspectors take are used to inform fisheries management decisions and policies. Now, what I've shown is that the numbers can be inaccurate in some cases, and so what do you do? One approach among a portfolio of strategies to combat illegal fishing is to deny port access to vessels suspected of illegal activity. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations has introduced a binding international treaty where states agree to deny vessels the use of their ports if they're suspected of illegal activity. Now this treaty is called the Agreement on Port State Measures, or PSMA. Now to date, 94 countries have signed on to PSMA, and they're shown in blue on the map. And PSMA, the treaty, it requires things like inspections and logbooks, all for the adjudication and investigation of illegal fishing. The purpose is that if you deny ports, you deny the markets to these fish. And if enough countries can sign on and share information, it gives these vessels involved in seafood slavery, involved in fish laundering and illegal fishing, nowhere to sell their fish. So my project was specifically to use satellite technology to track transshipment vessels to port in order to create a mechanism to inform this international treaty. Now I did this using satellite data from what's called AIS, or Automatic Identification System. Now AIS is a little transceiver uh, that reports a vessel's position 
and it's required on large vessels. And what you're looking at is an animation of fishing vessels who are transmitting AIS all over the globe. Now, the AIS transmit, like I said, it includes their name and positions, and it was originally developed to avoid collisions at sea. So the satellites and towers receive these AIS signals. And I analyzed the AIS data provided to me by the NGO Global Fishing Watch, whose visualization you see here. And we sorted through the AIS data to show when transshipment vessels went to port. And I wish that was as easy as it sounds. From 2015 to 2018, our, da our data resulted in 67,308 port visits made only by foreign vessels, where the vessel came from a country or was registered in a country that was not where they were delivering the fish. Using AIS to inform the Port State Measures Agreement, PSMA, and therefore deny ports to vessels suspected of illegal activity, we can look at the information from a whole, a whole bunch of different ways in order to inform the treaties and in order to enable nations and states to properly uh, enforce and implement this treaty. We can look at information from a national point of view where what ports are refrigerated transshipment vessels using? Are they visiting one port over another? And if we know this, we can stage resources more effectively. We can look at it from an individual uh, port perspective and look at the individual vessels and where they come from and who's showing up. We can actually flag known bad actors and follow individual vessels across the globe. We can follow uh, a country's fleet as it goes out across the world too. Now, all these aspects are useful to leverage stakeholders and parties in PSMA. And by doing this, I also hope to combat illegal fishing, leverage global fishing conservation efforts, and attack the conditions for seafood slavery by tracking transshipment vessels. So once the methodology and some of the analysis was in a solid place, I pitched this project to the US Department of State, to NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and to the United States Coast Guard. Those are the three US agencies responsible for implementing PSMA in the United States. So I'm privileged and pretty honored to say that I was invited on to be part of the United States delegation. Um, and I was invited as, as part of the US delegation to the Food and Agricultural Organization Agreement for Port State Measures. I was brought on as an advisor and as part of the US delegation, discussions on the floor and treaty talks that occurred last week in Santiago. I just got back in on Sunday. At the international level, I was able to show how transparency this methodology that we derived and the application of AIS can help this international treaty and address the global challenges in fisheries. Using my project, I acted as an advisor in technical working groups uh, with countries who participated in the UN FAO meeting that was last week. And you can kind of see my forehead in the background. There. <laughs> so that's it, that's what I've been up to. That's the project. None of this would have been possible without my capstone committee. I have to thank uh, Jen Burney from the School of Global Policy and Strategy, who's presently at a National Geographic Fellows Symposium of her own. See you on YouTube. Travis Schrammick, who's from the Coastal Observing R&D Center, who, fun fact, was once interviewed by Neil deGrasse Tyson along with Kelly Slater. Uh, and ab absolutely Sarah McDonald, my committee chair, a visiting scholar at Scripps Institution Oceanography, also with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch and also with the Seafood Slavery Risk Tool, whose work in seafood slavery was the inspiration, inspiration for me to pursue this project. Uh, to Samantha and Risa and the rest of the staff at the NBC MAS program, the skills that I learned here were put to use at the UN meeting that I was at. Uh, to the NBC cohort, I think that the next project needs to be putting, mapping out where all of our projects are influencing places across the world, from Antarctica to Peru to the UN and everything. And lastly, to my wife and daughter, who are simply the best. I'm available for questions. <laughs> I've got someone back there. Yep. So, uh, I lost the vessel fishing boat, but I don't, what is the sense if a vessel has to use transshipment, like to buy fish from an illegal fishing boat? Like, is the small price or the question of offer? Or, uh, what? Simply don't care. So, what's the incentive for a vessel to buy illegal yeah, fish? Well, 
Well, two different reasons. Number one, you can contract these transshipment vessels all over the place. So let's say we start a company and we're like, hey, let's go fishing. Well, what are we going to do? To be most efficient and economical, we're going to keep that boat out as long as we can to fish as much as we can to put as much product on the market. And the way that I can do that is I can keep that fishing vessel at sea by transshipping onto these cargo vessels, and that cargo vessel can then deliver the fish. So I think that's really the incentive. The other part is by having no labor cost, you increase profit, and you end up making these human rights violations because it ends up being economical, as sad as that sounds. Sir? Yeah, I was just wondering how the financial transactions happen between the fishing vessels and the refrigerated cargo. Are they all cash-based, or are they wire transfer through banking institutions internationally? Or? There's probably seven different ways to answer that question, okay. right? Um, there was one transshipment vessel that was a case study in Japan. They had 27 fishing vessels offloaded onto that one cargo vessel. So to follow that from the position to the regulations to who owns what company and so on and so forth is a quagmire. Sir. Are there any things that ports need to look out for in particular when uh, transshipment vessels are trying to come into port? Yes. There's a lot. So is there, <laughs> is there a lot of things um, that ports need to look out for? There's a complicated answer. Let me give you a, a, just an idea of how much work needs to go into this. There's a different agency just in the United States who has authority over the ports and the movement of the vessels. Then there's a different agency that has authority over the labor on those vessels. Then there's a different agency that involves with the market trade and when that fish, the fish becomes a commodity and enters the market, right? So just right there, all I did was bring a boat into the port and I offloaded it. And we've got three different agencies right there and three different authorities. So being able to coordinate and cooperate the like uh, intersection of all the laws and regulations in order to uh, adjudicate a case like that takes a whole lot of work. So that's a really uh, long way of me saying, yeah, there's a lot to look for.